What's going on, podcast listeners? My name is Michael Chernow. I am a restaurateur and lifestyle entrepreneur, and I am truly obsessed with living a life better than yesterday through wellness, fitness, and good vibes. I've always wondered if the drive to succeed is something we are born with or if it's something that is made over time through grit, drive, and perseverance. I get to answer that question exactly, and the goal of this podcast is to talk with people that have absolutely crushed it in life and have inspired me to do the same. This is Born or Made. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am unbelievably excited to introduce my next guest on Born or Made. I've known this guy since I'm, I don't know, 17, 16, 17, maybe 16, 17. Probably 17, yeah. Um, Roy Choi is a very old friend. Roy Choi is uh, one of the few people that really knows uh, the old Mike Chernow. Um, Roy Choi <laughs> also happens to be uh, a chef, a restaurateur, an entrepreneur, an author, a TV host a philanthropist, an activist. The guy is um, one of the most inspirational guys I've known throughout my career. He's influenced so many people. He is truly the OG god of the revolution of food trucks <laughs> globally. Um, Roy is just, <laughs> just a really special dude, and I am so grateful to have him on my show today. So uh, welcome to Born and Made, Roy. Oh man, it's an honor to be here, Mike. Uh, I'm doing this because because of you, man. I don't do many of these. I don't do many of them all. Um, and uh, it's really hard to get me actually on a podcast or on an interview and stuff like that. So uh, I'm just really excited to be here with you. Well, I appreciate it, man. I know that you're a busy dude, and um, I, you know, when I was thinking about who I who I wanted to have on this show, you were definitely the top of the list. I think I emailed you or texted you probably a year ago uh, when I mm -hmm. first started developing this thing. And so we finally put it together and, um, yeah. you know, this is, this is perfect. And, um, you know, I guess I want to get, I want to, I want to talk about some really important stuff first, just because you and I come from a place of uh, hard work. Uh, we come from an industry mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, you don't see color. Uh, we come from an industry where, um, you know, teamwork is, is everything. Uh, and without it, uh, you're nothing. And, uh, that doesn't have anything to do with where you're from, who your parents are, uh, what language you speak. Um, so we come from a very inclusive place and right now we're, we're, we're coming off, uh, an unprecedented, uh, pandemic, which was obviously devastating for our industry, uh, that rolled right into, um, this, terrible unbelievably terrible incident um with george floyd that has that has really sort of made massive waves um i believe in a positive way across the globe where people are standing up <clears throat> and um and so I, I just wanted to sort of like talk about that before we dive into into the the stuff that i typically talk about on the podcast because i think it's important um from a guy like you especially uh that really sort of stands behind community stands behind um, you know, just everybody that's out there working hard. How are you taking so, this? Well, damn, you just starting light, right? You just starting with, you <laughs> just, just go, let's go, bro. I'm just know, starting I with the appetizers. Huh? Yeah, man. Um, yeah, it's a crazy time right now. You know, uh, the injustice is real. And what you're seeing right now, you know, we're taught our whole lives that authority, you know, I've always been someone that's been allergic to authority, you know, and, um, and it took something like a kitchen for me to finally listen and figure out that, the, how I could fit into a system because I was always someone that rebelled against the system. Um, but a kitchen and hospitality became more of like a martial art and a dojo to me. Um, so the authority was someone that I trusted was someone that I could believe in and that it was a course and a path that I could, that I, um, committed to, you know, wholeheartedly open my heart, open my hands and, um, 
and, and decided that this is something that I'm willing to put my effort into because the person teaching me or the profession or the craft that's teaching me it is has the best interest of myself and the journey involved. But authority, what, what's happening right now is you're seeing the cracks of authority and of the of the injust system finally being confronted because we're taught to just listen and obey these systems. And these systems are very flawed and these systems are very, um, they're very prejudiced and, and they keep a lot of people down basically, you know? And so, but when what's happening now is because the collective voice wasn't demonstrating and, and echoing that same idea that same common idea uh idea or same common voice of that this is unjust it got it got thrown away as if maybe only certain people or you may be making up your side of the story or you know what maybe you were half wrong that's why you were put in this position um but the criminalization of black lives in this country the criminalization of marginalized populations uh, you could just look at not only the not only the brutality and and the murder of of folks in this country, but you could look at the systems that are given that are are left for a lot of marginalized communities, my, um, especially minority communities. You look at the school system. You look at the um, the nutritional system. You look at job access. You look at job training. Um, you look at uh, how you know how uh, racial being racially profiled. Uh, affects not only your reality but also your psychology in how you may look at the world how the world looks at you and how you may be able to progress in prosperity i know this this is a podcast that focuses on prosperity and business and growth uh, some you know what you're seeing right now is that there are many many people in this world that don't even have that opportunity um, for those that that are hearing this for the first time, it seems like a shock and it seems like something um, unbelievable, but it is unbelievable. You know, it is something if you've grown up with it, you know, uh, I definitely, someone as, as an Asian American, as, as a minority, as an immigrant in this country, I deal with my own levels of racism and, and marginalization, nothing close to what um, black Americans have to deal with in this country. But uh, I, I deal with I, I deal with it in certain ways, and it, it's tough, man. When you wake up every day and you know that there are um, that there there are eyes on you that you have to fight through, and that those eyes also now lead to an accordion of microaggressions, physical aggressions, also restrictions and ceilings. Um, it takes a toll on, on you. And then you put into that not only mental health, but also um, I also think of being being someone that's creative. You think of all of the other things that contribute to the prosperity of life, like uh, design, architecture. I know you love to design stuff, right? And, you know, you created the meatball shop um, and you believe in aesthetics and fashion and all of these creative outlets that just even the way... Uh, an interior window is placed. Um, but you look at a lot of, uh, a lot of housing that, that a lot of uh, marginalized communities are placed in, especially section eight housing. And um, not only are, you, are, are they being stripped of direct tangible things like nutrition, access to quality food, access to restaurants, access to Wi-Fi, access to a coffee shop, these things that a lot of society takes for granted access to an apple, a banana, an orange, you know, like just basic, basic shit, you know, but then at the same time, it's designed too. Um, you know, very dreary uh, walls and furniture, mold, mold issues, mold problem, water, water issues, um, you know, uh, not enough light, no windows, uh, you know, all of these things affect our the way that we value ourselves, the way that we value and look at our ability to progress in the world. So I guess what I was saying in all this is that what you're seeing in the anger and the expression and the resolve and the determination of the protests um, is that finally the co there's a collective population and especially young populations that like, I'm not going to take this no more. Like we always 
say that in every generation. And if we look back at different revolts and revolutions, and there are momentous historic occasions where people have finally, have finally come together and stand up and say, we are not going to take this anymore. Whether it's an individual um, that, that makes a protest or whether it's a collective group or a college group or even a neighborhood or a group of four people that sit down in a restaurant and then uh, you know that steamrolls and echoes into desegregation. There's, there's what's happening right now is that, and I've been talking, I've been out there on the streets, Mike, and I've been talking to a lot of, because uh, we serve the streets with Kogi, even though I'm a bit older, you know, they call me OG, which equals basically old motherfucker, you know, <laughs> but I'm, I'm an OG, but they, they, you know, they trust me. So they, you know, a lot of folks, young, young folks be talking to me and they're, you know, what you're seeing right now is they're just saying like, yo, like we trusted you all. We trusted you guys as our elders. We trusted you guys as our fathers and our mothers and our, and our authority. And you left us with this shit. You left us with this world, an environment that's crumbling, a world that judges based on color, and, um, and, and, and this American dream that we can't even achieve. We can't even get a job. We can't even pay our bills, and we're in debt. And, and you've given us this, this, this broken promise, and we're finally, this was the, this was the last straw, you know? Seeing George Floyd lose his life on camera in real time was the last straw. Um, I, I know there are a lot of people in positions of authority that are hoping that this will all go away. But from what I've seen this last week, Mike, is that it's not going away. This is truly power to the people from what I've noticed. And this mm. is truly something that um, is going to uh, push the boundaries of change. I don't know exactly what those changes are at this moment. Obviously, there are things that you hear on the marquee, like defunding the police department, re redistributing funds, um, creating an oversight committee, looking at things like um, redeveloping new laws and new standards for how to train authority, mm -hmm. um, looking into community policing, um, and really looking at our structure and looking at whether or not this is the correct model for us as humans, and especially this younger, newer generation that is gonna take us further because it's not only what's happening on the streets, but it's also what's happening in our environment. You know, right before the pandemic, if you remember, there was a huge, there was a huge movement um, pointing out the huge holes within our, within our human life and our human existence about uh, how we treat the earth and how we treat, uh, how we're killing the earth. Um, so there's a lot of these things that are, our younger generation has inherited from us and the generation before us mm -hmm. um, that they're just sick and tired of, you know? And it, it's, it's tough because imagine if you're, the person you looked up to your whole life was a fucking fraud, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like whatever it is, whether it was your big brother, whether it was your, your parent or your father or your, your, your elder or your teacher or whatever it is. And that's what I'm seeing right now is that there are millions and millions of people waking up and saying, yo, like we gave you a chance. We, we listened, we went to school, we tried to be the human that we were taught to be. And now we've, we've peeled away, you know, we've peeled away the carpet or opened the closet door and look, you know, everything you've taught us is, is a fallacy. And so, um, uh, I'm excited, man. <laughs> I'm excited to see what happens next because uh, I made a I made a small post. I haven't been too I've been vocal, but I haven't been like on, on a soapbox or anything on social media. But I uh, I made a a slight comparison to like I feel the world has to be a little more like a kitchen, like how you opened up you know, in our industry, because right now the world is in the weeds, basically. Yeah, we as they as humans are in the weeds. But mm. what's great, what, what's, what's okay is that you get in the weeds, shit happens, you know? But it's how, how do you address those weeds? If you're constantly being in denial or protecting what, what is getting you there and only a few people benefit from that, but everyone else is having a horrible experience, that doesn't make sense, you know? Like if everyone in your restaurant is having a horrible experience, 
but you as the owner and maybe the manager are sipping champagne, eating caviar. That doesn't make sense, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, if the food can't get out of the kitchen, but you're, you know, you're having a good time. You're, you're doing interviews and magazine covers and um, sip, you know, like, you know, people are kissing you on the cheek and you're, you're being getting the accolades, but your your food can't get out. That doesn't make sense. So we have pre shifts. We have meetings. We have if there are 30 tickets on the line and the food's not coming out, you know, like you stop what's going on. You get everyone on the same page. You call time out, you know, um, and you pull it together, man. You pull fucking together. I mean, dude, and I like, think that I, um, we're in the weeds. What I'm hearing from you, first of all, thank you. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, thank you for speaking from your heart and also not, not, not just saying how you feel, but actually laying out solution. Because I think that Mm -hmm. is, I think that is what distinguishes a leader, right? Like, you know, and I, and I'll bring it back to the restaurant industry. You know, we're not problem finders. Great restaurants are not problem finders. We are problem solvers, right? And so when I'm leading a team of yeah. people and they're coming to me with a ton of problems, I, got, I say, mm-hmm. hey, guys, go back and figure out the solution. I'm happy to hear about the solution. And let's go mm-hmm. all in on the solution. But if it's all about the problem, yeah. then, then there's a lot more work to be done. And I think that is what distinguishes mm-hmm. the difference between um, – leadership and chaos and in the weeds and getting pulled out of the weeds, right? Like when, when shit's in the weeds and I think, yes. and we are, I mean, notoriously you're in the restaurant business, specifically restaurants like yours and mine, where it just gets, they get crushed. You're in the weeds a lot and, and that's okay. Yeah. And it's to be expected. It's how you pull yourself out. And unfortunately right now, and I, you know, I'm not afraid to say it. We have terrible leadership right now. There's, in yeah. my opinion, the, the leadership that is actually uh, out there broadcasting is, is I'm embarrassed and I'm married to an, to, uh, an immigrant. My wife is from, from mm-hmm. Europe and she, has no, she wants nothing to do with the United States mm-hmm. of America right now. She thinks that, yeah. um, and not because of the protests and, and what's happening because of that incident or corona mm-hmm. um, as, a, as a problem, but because of how things have been dealt with. And so I think we're yeah. in a, we're in a, we're in a lack of leadership right now. And, you know, not just I, on federal, but on state, local city. Um, we have an out of touch, older generation of political leaders and economic leaders that are working off of, working off of a broken system and protecting that system. Uh, this needs to be a more collective system moving forward. We need to have voices from from all races, all 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 economic strata, you know, um, all all intellect, not just not just educate, not just like um, what's the word like, you know, secondary education intellect, but street intellect, you know, uh, compassionate intellect, uh, empathetic intellect. We need spiritual leaders. We need, uh, you know, we need things that are outside of just what we consider to be smart. Uh, we need a full rainbow of representation within our leadership. Right now we have, uh, you know, the few leading the many and the few that we have that are elected in these positions have no idea what it's really like, not only within their country, but within their state, within their city, within their block, Yeah. you know? And so um, they have to listen, man. They have to listen. They have to... They have to create task forces. They have to be a part of this on a day-to-day basis, just like running a restaurant. You know, people think we're stupid, like dumb, dumb fucks just running and cooking food. We're not, you know, the thing that makes the hospitality industry, whether your industry so amazing, whether you're just, whether you're a host in a, in a restaurant or a host at a, a check-in counter at a hotel, or you're running the restaurant or running the hotel is that. We are about the every every single transaction, every single ticket, every single uh, guest, you know, and we listen to our staff. Um, I think that's the most amazing thing about the hospi- hospitality industry is when we have these pre-shifts or we have these weekly meetings or monthly meetings, we allow our team and our staff to um, to come up with solutions, as you say. We, we allow them to speak. 
We allow yeah. them to air their grievances. We allow it to be a, a safe space and a, and, a, and a drum circle of ideas. And then we as those leaders, we take that drum circle of ideas and we filter them through and make sure that the best of those ideas are either hybrided together or they're, they're, they're used directly as is. And we apply those to the overall philosophy of how the restaurant grows. Mm -hmm. The restaurant, any restaurant out there is not just that one person, you know, the executive chef or the, the, you know, the, 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 the amazing young new entrepreneur. No, it's a collective voice that takes that, that first vision and, and helps it grow as, as it interacts with, with its customer base. And um, that's what makes restaurants so amazing, I think. And that's I what agree. I think could make our, our country amazing. Um, but the problem is these old motherfuckers don't listen, you know, and, and now we're in a position where they're going to have to listen. I look, you know, you know so. I've been thinking a lot about this, obviously, you know, yeah. being, being from born and raised in New York city, New York city is, is Do um, your listeners know the old Mike Chernow. <laughs> Do they know the not. old Mikey? They probably well, don't, okay. man. We, 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 we'll we get into let that them know today, later. But <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I just want to, and then, and then we'll get into some other stuff. But I, I just felt like it was so important, important, and and I knew that I was going to be on, you know, obviously speaking to you today. And I know that mm -hmm. how how passionate you are as just a human being with um with a massive heart and and care and love for everyone around you, um, that you would have something really profound to say about this topic. But you know, as I've been watching, you know, from my chair and seeing what's been happening, it's been it's made me think a lot about what defines because I believe this is a really this is a leadership this is really a leadership um, situation that we're uh, that we're dealing mm -hmm. with here. And and when I was sort of when I sort of come to that conclusion that this is purely a leadership, um, not purely a leadership problem. I mean, I believe ignorance is mm -hmm. lineage of lack of love that's what i believe yeah. it is it, it comes from lineage of lack of love because i believe that in order for human beings to love others we have to love ourselves and if you're not taught love at an early age or if you're not loved at an early age it's very difficult to love yourself so then what do you do in response to not loving yourself what well, you hate on others and so i believe that there needs to be a shift in that that focus on love in general and um, yeah. when i think about what defines a leader when I think about myself, when I think about people like you, when I think about other people that that, you know, we have we have rubbed shoulders with in the industry, it's really great leaders have the ability to love, communicate mm -hmm. and express passion in a real way. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and and that that shit, that's the shit that 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 people get really excited to be a part of. That is the that is the boat that people want to be on, whether the seas mm -hmm. are at 35 feet and rocky as mm -hmm. hell or whether it's smooth sailing. It's 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 being able to get with a group of people that love, that have passion and that communicate. And if you don't have those three things, which this country, unfortunately, right now is lacking mm -hmm. in a massive motherfucking way, um, we are we're we're we've got a lot of a lot of digging to do, man. You know, um, and I think as I'm glad you bring up love because love is is something that we minimize so much you know think about like even how you're raised how i was raised how we raise a lot of people you know we we live in a world that's focused on this competitiveness you know and mm -hmm. i know you're an athlete and and you know you work out and th there's nothing wrong with being competitive but we somehow have created this idea of competitiveness in that we have to destroy the opponent you know we have to whatever that opponent is mm. right you know you have to be on top and everything else has to be destroyed in order for you to quote unquote win right whether that's in sports whether that's in in life whether that's at, in corporate america whether that's in school and getting an a or a 4.6 gpa and getting into the college you want uh whether that's on the streets, whether that's in the restaurant industry, whether that's getting the award or whatever, it's always about like the ego. It's about I have to win, everyone else else has to lose, and that's the only way that the the universe can be uh, in balance for the individual ego. We have to break away from that, you know, and that comes from love. We have to put value in love. It, it 
we've we've spent so many decades devaluing um, the power of love, making it something that's cheesy or simple or it um, that you can't get ahead or that you need this this competitive drive to destroy in order to define what it means to be superhuman, you know. Um, but uh, we have to get to a, a more indigenous spiritual understanding of what love is. It's Dude, not, it is all, it is all. It's not simple, you know. It is all love. That is yeah. at the bottom line, at the, at the, at, at the core, at the structure, at the foundation. Yeah. We are one of the very few animals in existence that are actually able to express love. Right. And because we're one of the yeah. very few animals that are able to express love, uh, you know, in his ever, um, it, it is something that we actually need. It's one of our it's one of our absolute yeah. necessities. And so, you know, my my personal philosophy in life and business and my family and whatever it is, is that I know that we are here to love and be loved. And we all yeah. the decisions that we make in life, all of them, every single one of them, whether good or bad, the underlying yeah factors come down to am i going to be loved more for this am i going to be able to love more for this and yeah. and those that's that's how we as humans make decisions we murder for love we 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 win races for love we open businesses for love we put a a, a good looking shirt on our backs for love um we hug our partner for love it's all love and i know that and you know, when this whole thing went, when this whole thing broke, um, I like, there was a thought that went through my mind that I, you know, because I, I didn't immediately express myself on social media and I haven't really gone deep into expressing myself on social media. Um, and it's not because I'm afraid. It's not because I'm, I don't, I don't think, you know, I don't want to deal with the backlash of me saying something that somebody's not going to like. It's because I'm taking time to actually process what's happening but the first thought that came to my mind when this when i saw that fucking video the first mm -hmm. thought that came to my mind was i'm sad and i want to hug and like literally i was like i'm sad and i want to hug and i just know that that thought that very primal like instinctual thought that mm -hmm. came through my mind is exactly what the people of this generation that are that are standing up want right now and it is really disheartening that that they can't get it. And, um, you know, because if we could just stop and literally look to our left and look to our right and tell whoever is standing to our left and to our right that we care, that we support, that we love, dude, that is massive step in the right direction. And it's just and, and, and like you said, man, it's like we, we are dealing with people that are just not listening. And they're, all they're doing is waiting to speak, man. Yeah. And it's terrible. Can I ask you a question? What's it like being a white person right now in the world? Because it, it, it I, you know, I just want to hear it from you. But, but because there are so many levels of being white within yeah. this country. You know what I mean? Like you're a street kid from, from New York City with, with a Jewish bloodline, but you're white. But then there are, but then there's other levels of white. You know, so it's like, I don't know if it's easy for you as white folk to talk to each other about this shit, you know, because it, it's more than just what's on the surface, right? Like, like you're not, you, you're not completely, you're still Jewish, right? You're Jewish. So you're, you're white, but you're also, your, your, your heritage has been persecuted against as well. So there's, there's different levels of it. Like me as an Asian kid, like I could speak to like, like if we were the ones fucking up, like I could speak in many ways to like all Asians and be like, yo, listen, listen, dude, listen, you guys like we need to stop this, you know, and then there could be like a collective bullhorn that goes out. But I found that it's really hard for y'all to like check each other on shit. So know? I think I think I'm so happy you asked that question. Yeah, um, because I think um, it's a very interesting place to be right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 I guess bringing it back to my childhood, you know, I grew up in New York City, parents didn't have a lot of money, went to public yeah. school, and there was no color. Yeah. I, I was with 1000s of kids, black, white, Asian, you know, 
Latin. I mean, it was just, there was just no, there was so much diversity that racism yeah. never really played a role in my life. Now I know I'm privileged. Mm -hmm. I know I'm privileged because a, I'm white because I'm a man mm -hmm. and because I grew up in New York fucking city. Right. And so yeah. I, I, I know that, that that is a unique, you know, in my, you know, sometimes in my bubble, I think that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm like, I, I feel like, Oh, you know, <laughs> but like, Oh, this is normal. The truth is, is that it is not normal. Mm -hmm. It is, mm -hmm. it is, I'm a privileged human being. And I know that, however, I, you know, I don't, I don't believe that I should be ashamed. Like I know a lot of white people right now that are literally ashamed to be white. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's, that's a, that is a glass half empty way to think, you know, uh, that is a, that is a, you know, like self shaming is, 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 is just as bad as, as being racist, you know what I mean? As far as I'm yeah, because that's avoiding the issue. Right. That's just that's just playing the violin and hoping that someone you know understands your pain. You know, like confront the issue. I guess my main question is like, do white folk do y'all like confront your elders about like the shit? Like, but again, I know you're a New York City city kid, you know, with a Jewish background. But like, do white do white people like confront? their elders about like, yo, like, how, like, how did you do that? You know, like, why did you do that? And I don't agree with why you did that. Because it seems as though if what I've seen is a lot of racism happens in the home. Yeah, that's where it stems. And then it happens in the home, then it then it, then it travels out to the, to the, the group of friends. So a lot of people congregate together within the same, whatever, you know, race or neighborhood or you can social class and then it's easy for people to to make horrible comments about someone or to collectively uh bully someone you know or or hurt someone because uh there's no one to check anybody on it you know what I mean? yeah. whereas well, like I, I, in new york as a kid like i you know because i seen all your friends you know when i was back when, when we first met like if you were being racist like you're around a bunch of other people they're going to check you Right. Because you're in, you know, you're in a multicultural environment, but I just don't understand how this could go unchecked. I think home. I think what I think what you it know. comes down to. And I think I, I like I, I said something earlier on that, you know, yeah. ignorance is the direct result of lineage of lack of love. Right. Like that is my yes. that is that is genuinely how I how I feel about this, that that ignorance from any racial background um, is uh is 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 truly is a direct result of how you were how you were raised and um yeah. and so i think probably if you were to ask somebody that comes from a predominantly white um you know uh area in the country um and their you know their parents uh probably come from an even more predominantly white uh mm -hmm. area in the country there's no doubt there's racism mm -hmm. It's just that is just probably part of that the culture and the DNA and and that shit sucks, um, and mm -hmm. I think that it's very hard, you know. I hate hearing human you know human beings don't change. I hate that. I hate that term. I know for yeah. a fact, you know, I have gone through massive change in my life. I know that anybody can change. Anybody can change with the will to want right, and yeah. so. You know, I think that it, it's probably very difficult for those large communities of white people to sort of to 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 break the chain, you know, to break the chain of how they've been living. Because um, you have to give up something. You have yeah, to you, give have to up get, you have to get you have to get vulnerable. You have to get vulnerable. Yeah, and you, you know? have to get vulnerable. Yeah, but there's what you keep saying about love is I, I want to make it clear for whoever's listening is that you can still be a badass and kick ass and be centered around love. I think about what you do uh, in Thai, um, Thai, Thai kickboxing, for example. That's one of the most badass fucking sports in the world, but it's based around love. The Asian culture is about bowing, about giving yourself up and being vulnerable first, and then, and then kicking ass, you know? And then, and then, but also not only to your opponent, but love to the spirits you know in in 
in Muay Thai, you know, there's a, a lot of ceremony, right? Massive. A lot of ceremony before you fight, thanking the, not only the gods, but the ancestors and, and your family and the spirits and everything. That's all love. By the know? way, that's all love. I learned to love. Yeah. In, in in the rings of of Muay Thai kickboxing, that's where I yeah. learned to love, and you know I my you know I had mm -hmm. a really rough childhood, and uh, you know I pretty much moved in <laughs> with my best friend when I was a young kid, um, and so yeah. there was honestly you know there was lack of there was lack of love in my in my in my childhood for sure, mm -hmm. and um, and yeah. and you know I got I'm blessed because I did grow up in New York City where. Uh, diversity is is a real thing, um, you know, and 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 I'm and I'm in such a unique place right now because my wife and I have made a decision to move out of the city. I never thought ever ever nice. in my entire life did I ever think that I would leave New York City. Let alone, I you know, like yeah. being born and raised there, you wear that shit on your sleeve a little bit. You know, yeah. and and because the streets taught me when you tried to live here in L.A. for a little bit. <laughs> no good, you, man. You looked miserable, man. Oh, man, dude, that city, <laughs> that city chewed me up and spit me out fast. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> but, you know, like I, I just I, I it, so we've decided to leave. And my biggest challenge, my biggest challenge with leaving New York City is not the streets and my kids and learning those street smarts, because. You know, my wife said something to me for a minute, for a while it was. I was like, how are they going to get the street smarts that I know make me the guy I am today? And she mm -hmm. said, so what are you saying? I'm not as good as you because I grew up on the countryside in Denmark. And I made me think. I was like, well, she's got a real point, you know. Yeah. The biggest thing for me is the diversity. It's the diversity that New York City offers because as this is on, as this all is going down, I, have, I just have love in my heart, man. I have love in my heart and I, and I feel... I feel for everyone. It's not a, I, it's, yeah. I just, I just have love in my heart. And when I see a person, let alone a massive, massive global group of people suffering because of something that is so ignorant, yeah. it makes me really sad. And, you know, well, and it's, it's, it's we'll crazy. We'll see where it all goes. I, I think yeah. we're at the precipice of change. Yeah. It's happening already in just two weeks since since uh, George Floyd's murder. Uh, there, there are actual policy changes happening. Um, and hopefully this is the, the, as you say, that you believe that people can change. Hopefully this is the beginning of a new change, you know. We I haven't think, had an upheaval, uh, upheaval and a systematic social, sociological change like this on this scale, maybe since the civil rights movement, you know? Dude, and if so, the Hasidic Jews in Williamsburg can have their own community leaders and their own yeah. police departments and their own laws and their own rules, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, why can't we figure out a way to do that? Uh, across the country, truly. I mean, I know that that's, a, that's yeah. a grandiose way of thinking. That's a great. That's a great example. It's a great example. But you know that that is real. That is actually mm -hmm. they they have their own they have their own police department, mm -hmm. their own fire department. They have their own schools. They have their own laws. They have their own way of life. And 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 nobody fucks with them. You know. And uh, I you know. I guarantee you you're you're touching on one of the most critical issues of of why we're at this juncture is because the 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 policing force of our of our society doesn't live in many of the neighborhoods that are marginalized right so they don't understand the cultural connection and communication and relationship so what happens is it just leads to antagonism mm -hmm. you know on both sides you know what you're touching on like with the hasidic jew population is it's the same thing how can you get a police force or whatever to understand the re religious context of how a community is living especially such a deep religious context like you know the hasidic jew community jewish community so it's like the only answer is we need to we need to police ourselves. We need a community to under uh, our community to understand our needs, and that's exactly what's happening. That's a great example. I didn't even think of that. That's a great example, you know. And that's 
that could be an example for how we move forward for 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 a lot of what's going on right now. I, I, it's something that I've been thinking about. I'm like, man, these yeah. guys have been doing this forever. Um, so anyway, look, you know, I yeah. just I, I'm I'm really grateful that you spent the time with me to talk about it because I think it's really important, and I think for, especially from people like you who have a big voice um, in in a number of different communities. You've been you've been doing this hit for a long time, man. I mean, with local, you yeah, yeah. you know, it's like you've been you've been on this path for uh, a long time, and um, and I just I respect you uh, so much for it, you know. Yeah, I, uh, I'm you know, sometimes the power is in not having to draw attention and and speak about it all the time. Sometimes it's the work that you do, and I you know, those that know me know that I've been out there my whole life on the streets you know uh, i've been on the streets my whole life one way or another um so it's a part of my dna and, and it's a part of what i represent and and what i continue to be a part of in, in evolving you know i was a latchkey kid from f four years old i've been on the streets since four years old by myself my parents were just like peace we'll see you at dinner and i was gone you know and like um and then all you know all throughout high school, my 20s, you know, um, now as a, 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 as a taco truck vendor, um, it's something that I'm constantly plugged into and connected to. And I try to um, represent with love, as you say, with, with I, I try to break stereotypes of, uh, of what you think it's supposed to be or what you ridicule us or, or, or uh, try to define us to be. And, and one example of that is, 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 um, food trucks with Kogi, you know, like when I come from the culture of, of, of food trucks, of eating on the street. And finally, when it became my business, um, I felt not only qualified or, or, or connected, but I also felt like morally, like I was, I was, uh, you know, I was in a position to be a voice for, 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 for the people, you know, like I wasn't, I wasn't faking it. I wasn't a fraud or anything, or I wasn't coming in from the outside. So it, it uh, when I finally confronted that, I realized that I'm in this position. And so I got to speak up for those that can't. And, um, you know, when I, when we started Kogi, the larger society was still looking at, at food trucks because it came from immigrants as dirty and as something that, uh, you know, there were jokes like you would get diarrhea if you ate at a food truck or whatever. Mm -hmm. They were even being called roach coaches, you know, but now they're gourmet, you know, and now they're, uh, you know, an industry that everyone wants to get into. They're there, you know, and so and p many people have prospered off of that, which is great, you know, and um, people are hiring food trucks for their birthday parties, for the corporate parties, all these things. So, you know, that's for me a micro example of how. The world can change. I know it's just food, but, you know, and I know racism is such a bigger thing, but that's a, that, that was a facet of racism, you know, that was, that completely did a 180 mm. and it went from, you know, people equating the color of your skin to being something that's dirty to it becoming, again, the best restaurant in the world or gourmet or, you know, your Christmas holiday party to your most sacred precious things like your kids you know five-year-old birthday party that same trucks 10 years ago that you were making racist jokes at is now catering your five-year-old birthday kids birthday party so that's that's an example of how society people collective people can change yeah man yeah. that is such a great example because you're you're spot on you know, yeah. I, I want to I want to get into into your story um, sure. and, you know, the, the 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 purpose of this podcast, really, the premise of this podcast is to to talk about the nature nurture topic. Right. It's it's whether you think you were born with this with a, a sort of inherent or innate ability to sort of get to where you're at today or you think you were made over time through experience, mm -hmm. perseverance, grit. I know how I feel about uh, mm -hmm. this, this this question, but I but I, I don't think there is a right or wrong answer. I think that 
uh, it's just a cool, fun topic to talk about because I've done 20 something episodes of this podcast. And I will say that it's been split right down the center, whether people mm -hmm. think they're born or made. Um, so the way I like to get there is through your story. I want, I want you to take it back as early as you can remember. Um, because I think that, uh, you know, human beings love to hear stories and stories start mm -hmm. from the beginning. So let's go. Give it to me, bruh. I was born in Seoul, Korea. I, uh, being Asian, my story goes beyond just my life because um, I have roots of folklore and stories that go back thousands of years. You know, like from a baby, you're just told all of these things and stories about your ancestors and the lineage of your of your last name. And, um, you know, it's very, very, it's very Wu-Tang shit, man. You know, it's like, it goes all the way back, you know, and it goes to back hundreds, thousands of years, you know, um, through different civil civilizations from iron to bronze to gold, you know, like it goes back. I've always been raised to look at my life that I'm a lineage of this last name, of this root, of this tree. So there's that, there's that one thing, but then, um, you know, I, from the earliest that I can, can remember, we came here and, you know, my parents, like, uh, many immigrant stories, we came with nothing in our pockets, you know? Um, and so my parents hustled for a living and by them hustling, they had to leave me alone. And so, uh, from a very young age, I, I was, um, I, I was, left alone to just roam the streets. And so, but what's weird about growing up in an Asian family is that they weren't abandoning me or not giving me love. It was just, they had to do what they had to do. And there was this like unspoken understanding. But as soon as they were home, it was like an overabundance of love. It didn't matter how much money we didn't have. There was never a lack of, of the things that were important beyond material. So, even if we didn't have, like, even if I look at them as adults now and like, maybe they should have made more prudent decisions financially, but even when they didn't have money and they owed a lot of bills and all these things, th there was always food on the table. You know, mm -hmm. like even when we were living in like studio apartments and, and all our bills were COD and, you know, uh, uh, utility bills were getting cut off, the, the refrigerator was never empty. And that came back to the fundamental philosophy and, and root of our family, you know, is that um, eating the dinner table, the family uh, structure was number one. Did you, you know, guys you, eat dinner together every night? All the time. So even though that we went out into the wild every day, they went out into the wild to sell everything from Amway to kimchi, you know, homemade kimchi out of the trunk to working odd jobs to uh, working multiple jobs. You know, um, it's a lot of families within our industry go through today. You know, they have three, four jobs. Um, their wife have has two to three jobs. Um, they have, you know, and they can still barely survive. And that's what it was like for a lot of Asian immigrants back in my generation. But then even with all of this going on, there was it, it there there was the one thing that I do admire about my parents and that, I, that, that, that has built me as a person is that no matter what, there was a consistency to everything, right? Mm. And I see in your Instagram stories about habits, you know, and working out, it's a, it, there was a consistency. So no matter what was going, no matter how many things they had to do, no matter how much hustle they had to do, it was 6 p.m., you show up at 6 p.m. at the house, you know, it was like the old days, you know, before cell phones, like <laughs> when you when you were going to meet someone. Right. You know, it's like 2 p.m. This spot. You got to be and, there and you, you got to be there. You got to be there. And that's what it was like every day of my life. So even though shit was wild in my life, I always had that throughout my life mm. um, and through all the imperfections and, and all of the drama and everything growing up. Even when we hated each other the most and even at my worst, there was still that. We still sat at the table every day. Even if I couldn't fucking stand my parents and they couldn't fucking stand me, we still sat at the table every day and ate. And so that was how I grew up. Um, you know, for the first 12, 13 years of my life, um, you know, uh, 
we didn't have that much money, you know, straight up. Um, and we were bouncing around, moving a lot. Um, it felt like, it felt in many ways like uh, I was living out of, like, there was always, like, my memory is like there were always, like, cardboard boxes everywhere because we were ready to move at any time. Hmm. And then, miraculously, uh, when I was 13, my parents, like, literally struck it rich overnight. They got into the jewelry business, into loose gemstones. Um, and at that time, they just found a lane. You know, they found a lane of, they took uh, Tiffany, Tiffany Cartier, uh, Harry Winston, uh, Van Cleef, you know, those designs. And they kind of like took all of those designs and those stones and they kind of like bootleg that shit, you know, <laughs> in a way, but in a good way. They took the, 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 and then they, so the jewelry industry has this huge markup, you know, like literally like 60, 70, 80% markup. So they took that and they cut it all the way down fucking like wholesale style to 10% markup. And they just hit the pavement and went to the immigrant community, the Korean community. And my mom is an amazing, she's like, um, she's, she's a force to deal with. You know, she's like, she grew up as a really beautiful woman, but also a very strong minded woman. And, and she was a hustler. So she, 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 you know, she was three the hard way for sure. And when, when she, when they found this lane, you couldn't get my mom off your back. Like if you were, if you were, uh, had any type of success or wealth within the Korean community or the Asian community, my mom was knocking on your door <laughs> <laughs> and she, and she wasn't leaving until you bought those encyclopedias. You know yeah. I, mean? I love yeah, that. And she would come and like, she'd show up at like bowling alleys. She'd show up at, at, at birthday parties. She'd show up at your, your place of residence at your work, whatever. And she, she roll up with like these rings and these pendants and these tennis bracelets with like D flawless diamonds and VVS. And, um, and they would look, uh, similar, but a little bit different and original from like, let's say a Tiffany. So like, let's say if a Tiffany ring was 70 grand or whatever, 70 G's, you know, hers with the same stone and even better stone, would be like maybe 15 G's. All right, know? I just want to so, stop you here. So yeah. this is, this mm -hmm. is, this is, I, I, I love this because I think yeah. that hustle mentality is, is what it takes, right? I mean, that is truly yeah. what it takes. 